My name is Loie Lane, and I'm so excited to tell you guys about my new podcast, Internet Urban Legends, with my BFF, Snitchery. We deep dive into the darkest corners of the internet to uncover whether some of the most notorious web myths are hoax or whether they're con. Internet Urban Legends, available exclusively on Spotify. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to my channel, or welcome to my channel if you are new here. Hi, hello. My name is Lovey, and at long last, we are back for the part two of The Walton Files. If you missed part one, you probably aren't going to understand what's going on in this part, so you may want to watch it. I will have a link for it down below. But The Walton Files is a VHS analog horror series here on YouTube, uploaded by Martin Walls, who is a Chilean animator, and the series has kind of heavy inspiration from things like Five Nights at Freddy's. It is an incredible, incredible horror series. And here in these videos, I'm kind of attempting to dissect a lot of the meaning around it. In the first video, we covered episodes one and two, as well as a hidden video that we chatted a little bit about. But today we're covering, by far, the longest installment in this series, The Walton Files 3, Bunny Farm. The first part of this video is kind of like a brief recap of everything that we've seen so far, all of the events that have taken place in The Walton Files 1, as well as 2, as well as new footage from the St. Juana's Forest, which is where the canine facility is, which is where they've been storing everything from Bond's Burgers and Money Smiles Incorporated that went in there after the company closed down. This footage was from a supposed Local 57, a small nod to Local 58, another analog horror series here on YouTube. This is when a photo of a girl appears on screen, Sophie Walton. 22 years old. She was born in 1960, so we can assume that the year is 1982, which is confirmed later. We also are introduced to a second character, Jenny Letterson, who is 26 years old. The date of this footage is from October 15th, 1982, and the description box reads as follows. Hey, long time no see. The following footage is about a 1980s video game created by the company. The reason it took me so long to get this footage is because the game was never really released to the public, and all footage available was from the beta version of the video game. During October 1982, a few test bunny farm machines were distributed around Brighton, Michigan, the city where Bonds opened June 28th, 1974. This footage was from the arcade machine sent to Entfront Hotel. The two girls playing the game seemed to have lived there. The particular thing about these machines was that all footage from the game was recorded and then revised by BSI technicians to see if the game was ready to be published. This was one of them, and quite possibly the only footage remaining of the game. The footage itself was extremely corrupted, however, and it took me weeks to be able to piece everything together with the help of a friend of mine, but I'm glad you've all been patient for this. Seems to be a huge one anyways. As for me, I'm probably going on spring break next weekend. I'm going to spend some time with my dad. Anthony. Knowing that we are introduced to both Sophie as well as a second girl named Jenny in the beginning of this video and the description box, we can safely assume that this is recorded footage of them playing the Bunny Farms video game. However, Sophie Walton is the daughter of Jack Walton who created all of these characters, so you'd think she'd be pretty freaked out to play it, right? Well, when we get into the game, we first see the Bunny Smiles Games logo appear with Billy the Clown, and we are dated 1982. It appears that we have a golden ticket of sorts, and these two girls are able to play the beta of the arcade machine. Yeah, this is the game I wanted to show you, Sophie. Oh, huh. nice. Yeah, I played it for a while. thought you would enjoy it. <laughs> Thanks. Also, uh, they installed the machine in the basement of the building not so long ago, so please try to be careful. The janitor told me these are hella expensive. And delicate, too. Oh, I see. So, do I start the game? Yeah, let's go. In the beginning here, Jenny warns Sophie that, hey, these machines are not cheap. Be careful as you are playing this game. They weren't easy to install, and they're pretty lucky to even be able to play a beta of this, no matter how corrupted and strange it may be. Sophie doesn't react like a person playing a video game containing the literal brainchild of her dead father. Right, so you gotta choose a name now. <laughs> I see your name over there. 
<laughs> yeah, but the idea is that you play the game from scratch. I see. Uh, put my name over here then. So. <laughs> I can't go back. <laughs> Dumbass. <laughs> She's a little bit reserved and quiet, but also not like making any reference to Jack Walton or anything that has happened. I'm probably getting a bit ahead of myself here, but we know that Sophie was directly spoken to in the hidden video that I covered in the first part of the series. And when she was spoken to, they kept telling her safety and pills. You must be so surprised to learn about all of this, what really happened that day. I know you don't remember. So even though she is 22 years old at this point playing this video game, it seems that she still has no recollection of how it relates to her. Sophie adorably accidentally enters her name here as Sophie, and then she begins to play. The whole game starts off with a small clip introducing us to our now very familiar friends. Bon, Banny, Shaw, Billy, and Buzu. This game is also fully narrated by the characters, which makes it even creepier. It truly feels like they are speaking directly to us. And what are our old friends up to, you ask? What could they possibly be doing in this game? They're holding a fruit festival, baby. All right, Benny. What day is it today? Right. Today is the annual fruit festival. We do a huge party on the restaurant every year. Oh, I forgot about that. Oh, heavens, me too. Well, I'm sure this party is much better than last year's, right? Well, uh, I need all of you to put your fruits in these baskets. You guys want fruits, right? Uh, no. That's right. They all forgot their fruit, but Pete the Hippo, a new character, and assumedly one just for this game, shows up and says that he will give them all the fruits they need in exchange for small chores around his farm. Sophie, who is mostly silent at this point, finally speaks up. Hmm. You know, something I like about the game is the, uh, the artwork. I don't know why, but there is something about it that seems, uh, really familiar to me. You would think, since Sophie is the confirmed daughter of Jack and Rosemary Walton, that she would know these characters of Bunny Smiles front to back. These are her father's characters after all. Yet, there's something only vaguely familiar about them to her here. Interesting. And like I said before, I think confirms that even at 22 years old, she is still suffering from some kind of memory repression or loss or just doesn't know what happened to her family. Jenny takes a moment here to briefly show Sophie the controls of the game and give her a brief overview. And then, okay, if you wanna watch me like fully react to this series, like we've done in a few of these videos so far, uh, I have the Twitch video over on my second channel, Lowy Bug. But there's this part where Sophie just interacts with the tree and Pete the Hippo says the word apples in the funniest way I've ever heard anyone say anything and I lose my mind every single time I hear it. And you use these buttons to interact with stuff. Yeah. Apples. He just goes, hey, apples. <laughs> It's so cute. This is the point where Jenny mentions to Sophie that she might experience some serious bugs playing this game. Yeah, this game looks very unfinished. <laughs> I saw a ton of errors and shit while playing the levels, and it crashed a couple of times too. Huh. That's strange, but then again, the game did clarify it was a beta test when we turned on the machine. And these glitches are freaky to say the absolute least. But it's when she mentions Bunny's Files Incorporated, BSI, Sophie has a strange reaction. Yeah, when BSI installed these machines, they clarified that as well, but here's the thing. These glitches are very freaky, if I'm totally honest. Um, that's why I wanted to show you this in the first place. I know you're into that BSI? kind of- BSI? Bunny Smiles Incorporated. Have I heard that name before? I mean... That company has been pretty relevant these past few weeks, didn't you hear? Sophie asks if she's ever heard that name, and then Jenny explains that BSI has actually been very prevalent in the news recently with the disappearance of an employee, Brian. Here, Jenny also tells the story of Ashley. Apparently there was this one employee that drove to some forest a few days ago, not too far away from here actually. He hasn't been seen around ever since he drove to that place. Reminds me of this other girl. There's more? 
This young employee named Ashley, people say she died inside of some old bunker from the company. Her body was never found. Most say she was privately buried. Others say she's still inside that place. Sounds like a made up story to get little kids away from that forest. And we should probably just continue with the game. So these deaths that we've seen happen in the first chunk of the Walton Files videos are largely being talked about. It's interesting because when we hear about all of this, it's like, how could the police not know? But it appears that this is pretty widespread in the media. That's just not the part that we're being shown. After all, our curated look into the Walton Files themselves, into Bunny Smiles, Bonds Burgers, it has been carefully, carefully handpicked. First for Sophie, and now for us, through our poster, Anthony. And furthermore, isn't it so strange that at this point in time, in 82, two employees have died, multiple people have gone missing from Bunny Smiles, from Bonds Burgers, from this entire corporate entity, and yet they're getting ready to release an arcade cabinet? Not the best priorities, in my personal opinion. Back to the game, Sophie directs her attention to a grave here, like a big monument um, erected in honor of someone who had passed. It reads, Bobby the Hippo was the original owner of the town. He had two sons, Pete the Hippo and Johnny the Hippo. Bobby made the promise of creating the best quality barn in the world. R.A.P. Bobby, older year to other year. This might seem insignificant, but I want you to keep it in mind for later. Sophie continues to play through the game, but She's absent-minded, as though she's not really thinking about the gameplay, but something else is occupying her mind. Again, not the reaction you'd think Sophie would have regarding her father's characters in a video game, but when she's mentioned Bunny Smiles Incorporated, she doesn't really remember that that well either, so I think it's safe to say she is just as in the dark as any new player might be. Aside from kind of an uncanny feeling that maybe she's heard all of this before. When she approaches Shaw the sheep in the game, she makes a remark that Shaw looks boring, which is of course deeply ironic, as that is her mother stuffed into an animatronic suit somewhere deep within the forest. Eh, I don't like this one. It looks boring. Aw, she's my favorite character. Oh well, it's up to you really. Sophie here picks Billy the Clown's level, and the game glitches slightly. And again, Sophie brings up how familiar the game feels to her. You know, I keep thinking about Bunny Smiles. It sounds so familiar. This game is bringing back so many memories, but it's so hard to just remember exactly. Ah. Uh. Sorry, um, probably just boring you with random thoughts of mine. I'll stop. No, 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 not at all, Sophie. However, I do, uh, I gotta do some other stuff. I got this one essay I need to finish. I'll see you around. Oh, alright. Jenny here encourages her to keep sharing these thoughts, but says she actually has to run and tell Sophie to enjoy her time playing the game. It isn't long after Jenny walks away from the arcade machine, that the game begins to take its glitches to new heights. Hi, Barn. Wait, shouldn't you be in the barn with the rest of the game? Yeah, everything perfect. I'm supposed to solve this party, but most of the stuff I need is located in the ridiculously complex puzzles. Say, could you help me out to solve the puzzles? Alright, first we need to get the party hats. They should be in the big. Alright, good track. Now we need. All right, how do I... While Sophie talks to Billy the Clown, he glitches out before his animatronic version appears over his shoulder. These are not just normal game glitches that one might assume would happen in the beta version of an arcade cabinet. These are deliberate, and the characters themselves are coming through letting Sophie and us know that they are far from done telling their story. Sophie makes it into a mini game where she has to collect party hats for Billy the Clown. When she walks off screen, Billy is quick to collect her, bring her back to the room, and if she tries to enter a storage room, Billy really quickly blocks it off. So 
she's really being controlled in terms of what she can do in this game. There's a lot of boundaries set in place. The audio plays again to find the party hats here, and Sophie remarks that the game is even more broken than she thought. This game is very broken, more than I thought. However, she continues to play these mini games with Billy, including tic-tac-toe, which she wins. Billy rewards her with a gift, and upon opening it, she finds a horrifying image. To me, this looks like the mangled face of Ashley, who is trapped within Billy's animatronic. The image startles Sophie, who calls out in real life for Jenny. Jenny? But she hears no response. When Sophie is back from the basement in the game, Billy's face is replaced with Ashley's corpse, and he won't leave her screen, making the game nearly unplayable. Here, Sophie tries to approach that gray rabbit character, the mascot of Bunny Smiles. And when she does, the game glitches so badly that it scares Sophie, and she quickly abandons it, saying, never mind. <laughs> Never mind, never mind. You would think perhaps this would be enough to scare anyone away from ever playing this again, but Sophie's curiosity got the better of her, and the next day more footage is recorded. We hear Jenny in the first part of this video asking Sophie what happened, and Sophie really plays off her experience saying, you know, the game crashed due to weird visuals, but I want to play it some more. Jenny teases Sophie for thinking the game is haunted in a sense, and also just downplays the glitches of the game even more, reminding Sophie like, hey, nothing to be scared of. It's just a broken arcade cabinet. Jenny heads off to bed here, and Sophie reloads her soapy save file. We get a quick flash of the gray rabbit, and then see a saddened face of Bon. There's an error message on the screen, which reads, there's a high chance bunnyfarm.ppx file data has been corrupted or its information has been altered slash replaced by a third party. We recommend you unplug the machine immediately. Opening the file may lead to unknown glitches and errors in the levels. If you do want to continue, however, we warn you that the machine could suffer major damages and at its worst case, a complete shutdown, deleting all valuable information in it. Do you still wish to continue? We have confirmation here that someone has physically been tampering with the save file itself, tampering with the arcade cabinet. It goes beyond the idea of these paranormal haunted entities, these characters that are all the spirits of everyone Sophie's ever known and loved. Someone has physically been in her building and tampered with this arcade cabinet. What have they implanted into the game? And more importantly, why? Sophie still loads the file, and it's here that she says she feels like she needs to dive deeper since this is the recording that everything went so terribly wonky on. When Sophie goes back to the monument from yesterday's recording for Bobby the Hippo, we briefly receive a message. However, it's not the same inscription that was on the stone from the day before. He promised to take care of the two kids during that day. He told the parents everything was okay. It's sad that we can't really remember you, Sophie, but soon we'll be together forever and ever. R.A.P. The Two Lovely Red Children. May 15th, 1962 to May 2nd, 1974, and August 22nd, 1965 to May 2nd, 1974. So much devastation struck in that year, 1974. These two red children, aged only 11 and 8, appear to have also died in this year and are addressing Sophie directly. Interestingly enough, if we're paying attention to the timeline, these dates predate everyone else going missing even before Jack Walton. This is the earliest that we have heard of anything going awry for anyone. May 2nd of 1974. Sophie, however, doesn't really seem to notice this message at all, and she just presses on, despite it being addressed to her. She approaches the Hippo House minigame with Banny, who's excited to take care of the barn animals. Banny, being a stupid bunny, according to Bon, uh, for some reason decides to open up a cage and release the pigs much to Bond's dismay. Bunny, you dumb bunny. I I'm, I'm sorry. I was just trying to help. It looks like they each entered a different door. 
we'll have to find keys for each door. Since the pigs have now escaped the hippo house, we now need to find a key for each door to get them to come home. But before we switch locations here, you can briefly see a missing poster for Jack Walton next to the barn. This minigame seems simple enough. Sophie, as Bon, begins to search for keys to unlock the doors. She receives the first by luring the hippo away from the couch with a drumstick of meat. Upon retrieving the key, she unlocks the very first door. Here, the screen goes black, unveiling that once again, we are inside an empty building. It looks like another simple glitch, until suddenly we're back in the hippo house. However, the two kid hippos have their eyes missing, and they aren't moving anymore. The hippo sitting in the couch is nowhere to be seen, and for some reason a portrait of a hippo on the wall has been replaced with one of Felix Kranken. The second key is found, a small red key. It's on the floor for pretty much seemingly no reason, but Sophie uses it and enters the room to find a puzzle. As she solves it, she remarks that the glitches feel like someone or something is trying to talk to her, trying to get her to do something. I noticed that these errors act in a certain way, as if that unknown error mentioned earlier was something or someone trying to talk to me or trying to get me to do something. Like if whatever is going on wants to get me to do something, because especially because these have all occurred when I interact with the characters, could it have something to do with them? I've also noticed that I talk to myself a lot. As Sophie is completing the puzzle, the footage glitches to Banny, and suddenly the screen reads Susan Woodings. What follows is an audio log from June 30th of 1974. BSI Technical Support, audio log number three, uh, June 30th, 1974. Jeremy's birthday party finished an hour ago. I decided to stay and help the employers clean the place. This week has uh, been a strange especially because of the opening. Uh, I find it weird that they opened the place even though Mr. Wharton disappeared a few weeks ago. I uh, hope he's doing all right. Rosemary came in today and asked if we'd seen him around. Uh, I'm pretty worried about it. Susan finds it odd that they opened, despite the disappearance of Jack, and a photo flashes of him across the screen as Susan adds that Rosemary has been seriously worried about Jack's disappearance as has Felix. It's then that Susan notes that while the first birthday party at the restaurant had gone well, there were a few irregularities with the animatronics, particularly Bon. Something with him just felt off. Everything went according to plan. Uh, this was the first birthday party in the restaurant, and I feel it turned out pretty well. Uh, I noticed a few irregularities in the stage and in the audio animatronics. As the engineer and the person who basically built the animatronics to begin with, it was easier to notice these. Uh, it, especially in Bond, uh, something something fell off. Uh, the limbs weren't moving properly. They looked stiff and odd, mainly in his right arm. It take a few more minutes to take him to the backstage, just to make sure everything's okay. We are getting so much information from Susan Woodings in this audio log, but one really interesting thing that she mentions is that Felix didn't even show up that day. Just didn't come to work. I'm the only one left. Uh, Chris left some hours ago, and Felix didn't even show up. I'll leave and close the restaurant when I'm finished. I'm sure it's not going to take long. And then she mentioned someone else here, a Chris that is also gone from the restaurant. Now, we've heard about Chris before in the very first episodes of The Walton Files from Brian. While Chris has certainly not gotten much airtime so far, it does make you wonder. Who could they be? Due to the fact that Susan lumped their name in with Felix and also Brian referenced Chris in regards to getting the canine facility job, it might not be far-fetched to assume that Chris is like a higher up or a manager of some sorts at the Bunny Smiles Corporation. Back to the video, we watch, or at least I watched, so nervously as Susan begins to take a look at Bon. While trying to fix Bon, it appears that Susan sees something that shocks her. Her eyes disappear from her face on screen. We then see Susan's mangled face, bloodied and disfigured as it morphs into Banny. It would appear that Susan has stumbled across a dark secret she was never meant to find. While trying to fix Bon, she discovered something. And I think that something is Jack Walton stuffed inside. Here, a photo of her body flashes across the screen. I am still alive, but I can't move and I'm having trouble breathing and my stomach feels weird. It reads. We watch here as Banny consumes a gift before her eyes open and she begins breathing as though she's truly alive. It's then that we get a congratulations message. 
Level complete. Great job, Soapy. You just made Susan beautiful. We know what happens to people in this universe when they are made to be beautiful. That is simply code for them being shoved into the shells of these animatronics. And Susan has joined the ranks confirmed. Here Banny's face flashes on the screen one more time before we find ourselves back in the overworld of the game. After a gasp, Sophie finally speaks. Uh, but that was very confusing and, and scary, but it felt like I was being told a story or a certain event. I mean, clearly I was, but um, yeah. Thing is, the pills have been making me forget a lot of stuff from my teenage years and my childhood and like I started taking them for a reason but I really don't want to think about it. Sophie knows someone's trying to talk to her, trying to make her remember what happened, but those pills that she's taking are making her forget a lot of things from both her teenage and childhood years. The game cuts back to the red forest loading screen but things look a lot darker than they did before. We can now see a figure standing off to the left shaped like a person. As Sophie flips through different little waiting cards on the loading screen, it swaps over to one that looks like it was written in real time. Linda Kranken is written here, with Kranken crossed out and written in as Thompson. Do not touch. As Felix Kranken shares the last name Kranken, of course, and has been referenced as having a wife, we can safely assume that Linda is that wife herself. It appears that what follows are her diary entries, though many will be redacted and crossed out in black bars. The diary is blurry and hard to read, but the closed captions offer a manuscript to read of sorts that's much easier to comprehend. October 30th, 1964. Felix has been acting really weird lately. He's been drinking more than usual. I'm very worried about him. I don't know what to do. He came home at 4 a.m. He was crying. He seemed very unstable and stressed. I don't know what to do. October 23rd, 1965. I know I haven't talked here as much as I used to. This month has been so, so, so crazy. I moved in with Felix last week. He was very happy about it. Yesterday, Jack and Rose had their third child, a little girl. Her name is Molly, Molly Walton. Jack and Felix have been pitching up the restaurant idea with a company that's interested in the project. The name Cyberfun Tech. December 26th, 1970. Christmas was nice. They built a doll, a gray rabbit, for Ed and Molly. Molly named it Rocket. Felix drank a lot yesterday. This has been a problem for a while. He's a good person, but he doesn't want to address this. It's getting worse and worse, but he doesn't notice. He feels bad about it, but he doesn't try to change. January 3rd, 1973. It's getting worse. He's so submerged with their project that he doesn't realize how much damage he keeps doing to himself how much damage he's doing to me. He keeps going places only to drink. Sometimes he even stays at the warehouse for the sole purpose of drinking. He doesn't listen. He never listens. I don't know what to do. May 2nd, 1974. Dear Felix, by the time you're reading this, I shouldn't be home. I know you're confused. I'm confused too. What you said to me last week hurt me a lot, but it opened my eyes. Hopefully this opens your eyes too. Our relationship isn't healthy. It never was. I'm leaving Brighton this morning. You're in the warehouse with Jack and the others as I'm writing this. By the time you're reading this, I'll already be in Hurricane. I know you're busy today doing Jack a favor, something related to a school party, I can't remember, but please go there when you have the time. As to me, I'll try to build my own life while I still can. You should do that too. I love you. Goodbye, Linda. In red ink, written beside this final entry, is written, I'm so sorry, Linda. I'm so sorry. But back to May 2nd of 1974. Wasn't that the death date on the tombstone for the two red children that we read about before? What happened that day to them? And what did Felix do? Sophie is nervous here, but presses on, approaching Buzu for another game. In this mini game, Buzu asks Bond to help him set up for a child's birthday party. Sophie finds the player character in a dark room, next to a large cake, two balloons, and gifts. Suddenly, glitched audio breaks through the silence. We see what looks like a glitched face on the left, with broken up letters that spell out Sophie's name as a text. It's here that Sophie remarks once again, 
that it really feels like someone is trying to tell her something. Again, I feel like this could be related to a person trying to tell the player something, maybe even a ghost, because this game really makes it seem like the people shown on screen died. Uh. Once again here, as she says this, that mangled face on the left shows up again, repeating Sophie's name in garbled text. Here the room goes dark. Then Sophie is once again faced with Buzu, who announces that it is time for entertainment. A minigame begins, a little flashcard memory game. It's uneventful at first, just like any old memory game. You guys used to play this when you were younger too, right? Anywho, so Sophie's playing this game and it seems pretty uneventful at first. That is until at one point when getting two flashcards of Buzu correct. Oh dear. He doesn't accept it here as a match. Now the game won't let her pick the correct card anymore. And when it finally works, a mangled face appears instead. Congratulations! After this game, they play a spot the difference game. It starts off easy enough, but by the second round and the second photo, we see a shadowy figure over the rabbit's shoulder. When selecting this, the game glitches wildly, and then the next round begins. There are several differences between these photos of Billy, but the most concerning are the two children at the bottom right. On the left, they're smiling in green, and on the right, they are red and frowning. Is this once again pointing to the red children that we keep hearing of? When Sophie selects them, a strange man flashes on screen. On the left, he is normal, poised for the camera, while on the right, he is mangled and bloodied the way all of our characters have been in the past. If I were to guess here, this would be the body that is shoved inside of the Boozoo animatronic. We were given the name Charles by Billy the Clown in the second episode of The Walton Files. Could that be who we're seeing here? Boozoo congratulates the player for beating his game and says it's now time for the party. Sophie finds a pair of eyes in the dark, and when illuminated, we see that same face from the Spot the Difference games. Missing, 07. 14. Begins sounding over and over again through the audio. Missing the 0714, missing the 0714, missing the 0714, missing the 0714, missing the 0714. Closed captions we can read here. Missing 071474. It's then that a bloodied version of Boozoo's face pops onto the screen, and the audio with simply the word missing plays over and over and over. The face from before flashes again, this time mangled and distorted. I don't remember my face, is what the closed captions read here. Sophie seems to finally be putting the pieces together, as this is the point where she says, at last, this is all starting to make sense to her. This is kind of starting to make more sense to me. I mean, as much sense as something like, something like this can make. <sighs> These are all faces of uh, people, people that I think I knew when I was younger. I knew these people and for some reason my brain just forgot about them or what happened to them. I doubt they're alive anymore. I mean, maybe they are, but it's unlikely because I would have heard from them by now. These are the faces of the people that she once knew, but has somehow forgotten. As she walks all over the farm here, we can now see the missing posters everywhere. There's nothing to hide. On each character's respective corner, we see their missing poster. On Bainey's, we see Susan. On Boozoo's, we see the unfamiliar man I'm thinking must be Charles. And that means that there's only one more area for Sophie to explore. Shaw's, her very own mother. Oh heavens, this place is so beautiful. Hi, Bon. Didn't expect to see you here. What are you doing here? Oh, I just really wanted to check on you and see if everything is all right. Oh, that's so sweet from you. However, I already finished my tasks, but you can stick around if you want. How about we play a game? That sounds fun. 
What would you like to play? What about hide and seek? Oh, I love that game. I'll hide. Great. This is going to be fun. Shaw here offers to play hide and seek as their game. Although, the minute that it begins, the game begins to very badly glitch in and out. Instead of their in-game sprites, Shaw and Bon here are shown as their animatronic selves. After the countdown when Sophie begins a search, we can notice a few irregularities with the overworld of the game. Two single graves lay off to the right side of the map, labeled E and M. We can also see an unfamiliar animatronic off to the left of the screen. When Sophie checks the woods, she's told that there is nothing to see here, but when returning to the game map, we can see that the graves of E and M are gone and replaced with two red children, E and M, Ed and Molly Walton, the two red children. It seems that we can be sure of their identities now, but Sophie doesn't seem to notice anything too peculiar. Ed and Molly have returned to their graves, and a gray rabbit now stands over them. Finally, when checking the barn, Sophie finds Shaw and receives a glitched screen of the sheep. You found me. That was nice. I had so much fun playing with you. How about you had now? But now, it's Sophie's turn to hide. And she does so, choosing to hide herself in the woods. Terrifyingly, we watch Shaw's animatronic make her way through the woods to Sophie's hiding place. When at last she finds her, Shaw asks, Am I so beautiful to you, Sophie? And then she rips off her mask, revealing Rosemary's smiling face. Am I still beautiful to you? Sophie. <laughs> I know you found you. Now we see a photo from inside Bond's Burgers with a caption overhead. I know where he is, Rosie. Follow me. And follow that mysterious voice Rosemary did straight to her demise. After another countdown, we see the horrific events that played out that night. Rosemary screams and the closed captions read, missing, Rosemary Walton. Last seen, July 19th, 1974. These images are so jarring and violent, and it seems that they really stir something in Sophie. Listen, I don't normally leave like swears or anything in my main channel videos, but I feel like this is necessary to the context of what Sophie is experiencing. She is in pure shock. <laughs> cut away here to a scene of the well from the overworld with eyes, and as they focus on the viewer, that unfamiliar bear animatronic rises from within the well. As he speaks to Sophie, I can't help but wonder who he must be. Come one and come all, welcome to my magic fountain of memories. Step right up and enter your most repressed experiences and get ready to be amazed by my magic. Let's take a small trip down memory lane, shall we? Tell me, what is it you would like to remember? Who are you? She asks by using a writing feature within the game. When the creature answers, he draws two red children, side by side, holding hands. Here goes nothing, says Sophie, before the game cuts back to a scene from May 2nd of 1974. An old house appears on the screen, and Sophie remarks that it looks a lot like her old home. We're greeted by a gray rabbit who tells us now that the mini game will be walking through the corn maze. But before we can get started, the phone rings. Hello? Felix? Jeff? What is it? Listen, I was, I was wondering if you could give me and Rose a small favor tonight. Oh, I, I don't know, Jack, today's been nice. It's, it's, it's about, uh, and Molly. They have a school event tonight. A school party, and they have no one to pick them up. I need to stay at the workshop to finish the paperwork, and Ross is, um, taking Sophie to the dentist. We were wondering if we could pick them up for the event and take them home later. Sure, I can do that. Really? Yeah, sure. Oh, thanks a lot, man. You're, 
the lifesaver Felix. <laughs> it's nothing. Alright, so, can't pick him up at 5 and get him home at 9. On May 2nd, 1974, Jack called Felix and asked for a simple favor, to take his kids to a school party and pick them up at the end of the night. We know a few things about this date, that not only is it the day that, of course, Felix was supposed to take Ed and Molly to the school dance, it's also the day that his wife left him for good. And finally, it's also the day that the two red children died. As Sophie begins to look for the red children, she's given a bit of a warning here that these memories are deep within her own memory. For this memory seems to be very deep within your mind. You must find them, Sophie. Oh my god, I gotta take a deep breath. That was this. Ah, uh, this is... This just got so much deeper than I thought, and now I think I... I know what's happening. I recognize these faces, all of them. I, I know all of them. As Sophie says that she knows these faces, she remembers them, all of them, the white bear animatronic leaves her a gift, and when she opens it, she receives a flyer for the Brighton High School party. The bear follows her until she finds them, the red children themselves. They sob loudly as they walk around her, and then they lead her to a black car. We transition into a new scene and watch as the red children fade into Ed and Molly themselves. We need to get ready for the school party, Molly. Come on. I'll be ready in a minute, Ed. I'm looking for Rocket. If we remember from Linda's diary entries, the gray rabbit that Felix and Jack had made for Ed and Molly was lovingly named Rocket. Here, Ed grumbles about Molly looking for that old doll, saying that they need to get ready to go. That's Ed and Molly. And a new figure joins the two children. This is Uncle Felix himself ready to take them to the party. Molly has finally found Rocket and they're ready to go. But something I wanted to note here is that Rocket is the gray bunny mascot of Bunny Smiles Incorporated. Rocket has been popping up over and over again, trying to tell us the story, but he was an unfamiliar face. After this brief clip in the car during the daytime, Sophie is now in the school at the party, the party that everything supposedly went down at. Follow me, Rocket says in broken text. Slowly, Sophie follows him, towards the sounds of the party. At one point, she passes through a wall, and when she emerges from the other side, she is now the two red children, Ed and Molly. Together, Ed and Molly search throughout the party until they find Rocket. All right, says Ed, we finally found Rocket. Now can we leave? Yeah, says Molly. The school looks very creepy at night. Where's Uncle Felix, anyways? He should be somewhere around here. We should look for him, says Ed. And so they do, until at last they find him sitting in the drinking zone. Uncle Felix, asks Ed, what are you doing here? This is a drinking zone, says Molly. You shouldn't be drinking. I'm okay. I'm really just feeling a little dizzy, says Felix. It's getting very late. Your parents must be worried. Let's go. And so they climb into the car after Felix has been in the drinking zone for God knows how long. I want to go home. Molly, we're, we're almost there. Don't you think you're driving too fast? Listen, I'm just, I, I, I'm just trying to get you to home. I'm just trying to get you to home quickly, all right? Look, I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I'm not feeling too good right now. I really just, just, I just want to lay in the bed and go to sleep. It's alright. We get that today wasn't the best for you. We understand. Everything is gonna be okay. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. As Molly tells Felix that it's alright, that everything is gonna be okay, instead of this dialogue on screen we see, it's all your fault. It's all your fault. It's all your fault. It's all your fault. <laughs> You got the bad ending. You couldn't finish all the barn tasks in time. Changes to, you crashed the car. 
you killed them. And finally, we know the fate of the two red children, of Ed and Molly Walton, the event that seemed to kick off the entire series of the rest of the story that were told in the Walton files. On the night of their party, when Jack asked their uncle Felix, his best friend, his business partner, for a simple favor, to take his children to and from a school event, Felix couldn't stay sober for long enough to get them home safely, and so he crashed the car and he killed them. The mangled, bloodied faces of Ed and Molly and the mask crying blood is all very hard to watch, all the while accompanied by Felix's screams. But it is what happened. Felix crashed the car, drinking all night, devastated by his wife leaving him. And the animatronic bear explains to us exactly what happened next. They didn't go home that night. He buried them here. He was too scared. He buried them there too afraid to face the consequences of his actions. But they found a way out eventually. But the two red children couldn't stay in the ground for long. They climbed into Rocket, and their souls now inhabit him. You have 25 new messages. Felix. Pick up the phone. What happened to my children? If anything happened, first you must tell me. You haven't told me in three hours. I need to know what's going on. I'm trying to call you all night. What the hell is wrong with you? I asked you to do one simple favor for me. I need to know. Where are they? Where did you... But that's not all, is it? There's still something you forgot to remember. They've been waiting for you. This has to all be so hard for Sophie to witness, but that's not all she needs to remember. After all, they're waiting for her. The screen lights up here to Banny, Boozoo, and Shaw. Bon finally approaches Sophie, and bloodied and manic, nearly rips off his face to reveal exactly who he is to her, her own father, the one who brought all of these characters to life and built a prison for both himself and their entire family. But before he can show her the truth, the final truth, the screen cuts to Rocket and two frowning faces appear beside him. That's the end. The credits roll and The Walton Files as we currently know it comes to a close. There are so many questions left to be answered, but we're gonna take a look at them after we review one final video together. This video is titled Guilty and it was posted on YouTube on October 16th of 2020 over half a year before the Walton Files 3 was even uploaded. We open on the usual Bunny Smiles logo, and what we watch next is a company greeting from April 15th of 1967. Felix here addresses his employees directly. In this video, he's hopeful and excited for the future. Then we get a December message from December 10th of 1972. Felix gives his merry best to the BSI employees, telling them Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We'll see you later. Then with a redacted title, we finally receive a message from May 2nd, 1974. The closed captions tell us that this is after the car crash. I, I messed up. I, I have a problem. And. Uh, and this has been a problem for so long that I, I can't even remember. Felix never intended for anyone else to hear this message. That much I'm sure of. He's talking to himself, recounting everything that happened that day. He's making this recording because he knows that he will wake up in the morning a little hungover, probably really hungover actually, and think that this was all just a bad dream, that Ed and Molly are safe and sound in their beds. But they're not. They are dead in the ground because of him. But it's important to know here that he didn't just bury them in any old forest. He buried them in St. Juana's, that same place that years later would house the canine facility. And suddenly the idea of this storage facility in the middle of the woods makes a little bit more sense. Was it there so Felix could keep an eye on the bodies of Ed and Molly to make sure that no one discovered them? Felix tells himself here, it's fine. Everything's gonna be fine. But then Rocket appears on screen, staring directly at the viewer. Soft music plays as the camera zooms out on Rocket. And this is the end of what we have so far. So 
let's take a moment to review the timeline of what we have so far before I get into thoughts, theories, and more. Ed and Molly, the two red children, Ed and Molly Walton, died on May 2nd of 1974. The following month, in June of the same year, Jack Walton goes missing. Jack Walton was last seen on June 11th of the same year, only a month after the death of his children. Susan Woodings was last seen at the end of June in 1974. Charles, who we don't know much about yet, but we do know is inside of Boozoo, went missing on July 14th. Then Rosemary Walton goes missing on July 19th. Ashley died on July 14th of 1978 and was then shoved into the Billy the Clown animatronic and Brian died October 10th of 1982. Now we only have Sophie playing this game in 1982 after all of this has gone down, trying to piece together the pieces of the life that was ripped away from her all alone, now with every memory of every last one of these murders. And I wanna say, right now. <laughs> I think that Felix Kranken is behind every single one of these killings. Even if it was Jack and the Bond animatronic doing a lot of them, I don't think that Jack was acting on his own or even like as a vengeful spirit. That's my personal opinion. Uh, we don't have that much to go off of in terms of how Jack Walton feels about all of this. But I firmly believe that this all started, of course, when Felix killed the kids. When I was watching this on Twitch, a lot of people added here, did he even check that they were really dead before he buried them? And that's almost more horrifying to consider. I really think that Felix killed Jack in order to preserve his own, like, freedom in order to not go to jail. He killed Jack out of fear that Jack would go to the police out of suspicion that Felix had murdered the kids. We never really get confirmation that Jack and Rosemary ever knew the kids had died. We just know that they thought that they were missing. What if Felix spun up some kind of crazy story and you know, he was just drunk. He never actually went to get them. Maybe they were kidnapped. In that case, Jack Walton's disappearance looks like that of a mourning father unable to cope with the disappearance of his children. Police don't suspect murder, but that's exactly what Susan Woodings finds when she goes to work on the Bond animatronic on June 30th. Susan finds Jack's body shoved inside of the animatronic. In sheer panic, I think Felix kills Susan as well and shoves her into the Banny animatronic. We don't know much about Charles's death, but I'm assuming that Felix, of course, had a hand in that as well on July 14th. Then on July 19th, Rosemary was called out to by a familiar voice, by someone who referred to her as Rosie, saying, I know where he is, Rosie, follow me. Felix then kills Rosemary and shoves her into the Shaw animatronic in order to shut up the investigation once and for all. And then we have Sophie, Sophie, who without any family left, was probably left to her uncle Felix to raise. We have confirmation that at the very least, she went on to work for BSI as a security guard. We saw that in the very first episode of Sophie in the Bunny Smiles uniform. Felix could never bring himself to kill her. And so he raised her, his little bunny, she is referred to. And he gave her medicine to push her memories down, to make her forget, everything that had ever happened to make her forget her entire family. He gives her a job at BSI and that is why she's still alive. But someone or something wants Sophie to remember. They want her to remember everything that ever happened to her family. Everything that Felix has been trying to suppress with pills and bizarre hypnosis videos that we have seen as unlisted links on the channel before. At 22 years old, Sophie has found out the truth of what happened to the family that Felix tried so hard to make her forget. And if I were her, I'd be pretty freaking pissed. All because of a seemingly haunted arcade cabinet in the bottom of her building that clearly was placed there on purpose and tampered with very deliberately by someone that we're not quite sure of yet. Sophie has learned the truth and this is where we're left. I cannot begin to emphasize how incredible this series is. At the end of watching this through for the first time, I was literally sobbing. Like I could not control myself thinking about Jack Walton walking up to his daughter in that video game, ready to rip off his face and tell her the truth. 
your whole family's dead. And the mascot of that restaurant that I created so many years ago, I'm inside of it. Like it, it is so powerful. And I also think it's so powerful how deeply I hate Felix. Like I've never hated a fictional character so much in my life. I think the reason that the series is so powerful is because it feels so real. We feel so connected to these people because they're just normal people whose entire lives were stripped away from every single one of them because of one man's selfish mistake. Can I even call it a mistake? One man's selfish decision to drink and drive with two children in the back of his car. That is why all of this happened because one idiot one absolute moron couldn't stay sober for the night i think i'm gonna kick his ass felix cranken if you're out there and you're listening buddy i'm coming for you and i'm gonna pee in your shoes this is not a safe space for felix cranken felix cranken is not welcome here i want to emphasize that nothing is more powerful than watching this series yourself and i highly recommend watching through the walton files from start to finish over on martin wall's channel it's a bit of a watch a little bit of like a movie night but definitely worth it if you want to truly feel connected to the stories of the people that we've spent hours talking about on this channel now. What do you guys think of this and how do you think the story is going to move forward? I'm so excited to hear like your thoughts and theories and everything down below. So make sure to comment, let me know what you think. For now, I want to say thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy the video, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I want to say a special thank you to my subscriber, Jess, who is a member of my channel. I am back to giving these little member shout outs at the endings of videos now that I am finally back to posting my membership videos. I actually just did a video reading scary stories to tell in the dark. It's in the members only playlist here on my channel and if you want to join my memberships all you have to do is click on that little join button. It should be somewhere around the screen. We would love to have you. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I love you very 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 much. Thanks so much for listening to me for so long. I love the world of the Walton Files. I've loved this deep dive with all of you. And until my next video, I will see you very, very soon. Bye!